Hey, Facebook people, I'm Mark Miller, uh, the writer of Kick-Ass, and I'm here to answer some of your questions on the comic book and the movie. Well, Joe, uh, the reason I created Kick-Ass um, is because I wanted to write um, a kind of a weird sort of autobiography uh, about myself, really. You know, I'd, I'd been working on characters like Superman, Batman, X-Men, The Avengers, all these things for years. But, like, I wanted to do something that was a wee bit more personal. And I genuinely did plan to be kick-ass when I was a kid. I had this uh, plan when I was 15, when I was doing my O-levels, like GCSEs at school. Um, and my friend and I sat and designed costumes and we were going to become superheroes. And instead of living in Gotham City or Metropolis, we were living in the outskirts of Glasgow in the countryside. Uh, so there wasn't a huge amount of crime that we could have been fighting. But like, uh, it's something we really planned to do. We went to karate, we went to the gym, we made the costumes, I'd come up with names for ourselves and everything. And at the last minute, didn't do it. But um, Kick-Ass is a kind of alternative autobiography of what might have happened uh, if I did, which is I basically got the shit kicked out of me, I'm sure, the first night I went out on patrol. <laughs> Well, um, Stefano, to answer your question, uh, Hit Girl is actually based on my oldest daughter. Um, uh, except, apart from the killing and the swearing and all that kind of stuff, you know, she's she's never, uh, you know, even read a comic book, I think, really, you know. But um, she said to me, when I was doing a movie called Wanted years back, um, it was another picture for Universal, back in 2007, she was on the set and she said, Dad, I can't wait to go to the premiere of this, it's really exciting, we're going to a premiere. And I was like, oh my God, it's an 18 and you're nine. Why am I going to uh, tell you this? You know? And uh, she said to me, well, could you maybe make up something about a wee girl or something like that so that the next film I can go to the premiere? And I was like, yes, I'll make up something lovely like a father and daughter super team and uh, you'll be able to come to the premiere of that. Then I started writing it and it became the most objectionable thing I'd ever written. There's no way a child could ever see this. And I felt terrible about it because it was another premiere she was still too weak to go and see, but she's seen it on DVD now, so it's all right. But Hit Girl was based on her. I mean, she's uh, visually like like Hit Girl, you know, and the relationship between Nick Cage's character and her is kind of like our relationship. And we would even do those little kind of exercises together. Like I used to take her down the swing parks and we'd do commando exercises together and all that stuff. So we had this crazed militaristic training thing going on when she was nine. And I wrote all of that into the story. Uh, Bram, uh, to be honest, there actually isn't a huge amount of imagination goes into the concept of Kick-Ass. If you think about it, you know, he's really just a guy with two sticks. You know, it's such a simple idea, really. You know, the idea of a superhero that doesn't have any powers uh, doesn't really require a huge amount of imagination in the same way that Spider-Man did or Superman did or even Batman. Um, but it's so obvious, I think that's why nobody did it, because it sounds like the ultimate rubbish superhero, doesn't it? I mean, if you try to sell the comic to someone and say it's about a guy who can't do anything special, then you think that's, that's going to be boring. But the boringness and the sort of mundanity of it is what made it actually quite interesting. You know, we've, we've seen, I think Marvel have got just over 5,000 superheroes and DC um, have got about 4,000. So we've seen about 9,000 heroes with powers. So to have one who's got nothing and he doesn't even have Batman's money to buy cool shit and everything, you know, then, uh, then suddenly stories started to write themselves out of that. It suddenly became very unique. Uh, Sam, the uh, the second movie is really interesting actually because uh, we didn't have any setting up to do. I love second movies like X Men Two. I love I love Godfather Two, Empire Strikes Back, Superman Two. It's like you don't need to go through that forty five minutes of why is he doing this. You just go straight in at the action, you know. And uh, we know who Kick Ass is really by the end of the first movie. So the second film is about exploring his world. Um, and instead of seeing like kind of him kind of on his own and maybe starting to meet a couple of people who are doing what he's doing what's interesting with Kick-Ass 2 is that suddenly he's got a team like the Avengers around him you know which is great we really broaden his world and then we see his antagonists start to appear like the, the world's first super villain appears the way the f world's first hero appeared in the first film um, so that's exciting and then they form a team as well and then you have a giant battle royale between them so if I, if I had to say what's different about him is he's got good at this he's got friends and the whole thing's getting bigger now so if you want to compare it to anything this is Star Wars becoming Empire Strikes Back. Uh, oh, Mikey, it's a difficult question. Which character is my favourite? Because I like them all. You know, I mean, it's a bit like you know when you ask your mum and dad who's your favourite kids. Because uh, I do feel really related to them all, and uh, you know, loads of loads of Kickass comes from my own life. Like um, Kickass is based on me when I was fifteen. Uh, Hit Girl's based on my oldest kids. Big Daddy's based on me as an adult and everything, so I kind of relate to the characters in lots of different ways. I think it probably has to be Hit Girl, though. I think there's something really cool about creating a character that you start to see referenced in the real world, like 
I mean, I've worked in comics since I was 18, um, and I, I've written characters that people will probably never see. So to actually be walking down the street a couple of Halloweens ago, and I saw two girls dressed as kick-ass, who I didn't know, uh, sorry, dressed as hit girl, on their way to a, a fancy dress party, was really exciting. It was a bit like being John Malkovich or something, where something that should have been in my head escaped into the real world. Uh, and I love that, you know, there's something lovely about creating something that other people like, uh, especially in other countries. Like, I love going, I was in the Manila recently, and like uh, there was people there dressed as kick-ass and hit girl and, and I love the idea that something that started as a doodle on a pad has ended up becoming a, a kind of pop culture icon which is great. Well, Francesca, it's tempting to do more Kick-Ass because it's been really successful. I mean, pound for pound, it's been probably the most successful comic ever because there's only been 20 issues of it so far and already two feature films. And there'll almost certainly be a third one, I'd imagine, to finish the story. So my agent is kind of like, you know, keep keep writing them. We're, I'm getting 10% of this. Uh, but in my heart of hearts, I've, I've always planned to end it with Kick-Ass 3. And even if, it, even if the next one does a billion dollars, I'm still ending it with Kick-Ass 3. Um, I just... I'm a great believer in letting things have a good natural ending, you know, instead of just doing it until people get fed up with it. I think that's a terrible way to plan your career and it's a disservice to the stories, you know, just because it sells well, don't keep doing it. Like, J.K. Rowling could have written Harry Potter 14, but, like, she ended it where she wanted to end it and it's the same with, with Kick-Ass. I plan to finish it with, with Kick-Ass 3 and I'm, I'm just about finished. I'm about two weeks away from finishing it completely right now and I'll be sad because these characters have been with me since 2007, but I love the ending. It's a great ending, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm pleased to kind of do something. Normally the third part of a of a storyline is the rubbish one, you know, it's Return of the Jedi or Spider-Man 3 and it's one everybody moans about, but this is a really good conclusion and I'd like to get off the stage while people are clapping. I think just as people are getting into it now, like Kick-Ass 2 looks like it's going to be a lot bigger than Kick-Ass 1 and I think it's such a nice surprise to announce you're not doing any more after Kick-Ass 3. You want people to miss it, you don't want people to be glad you've gone. So unfortunately that's, that's it, Kick-Ass 3 is the end, you'll never see these characters again. Dave, my advice to inspiring writers, I would say, is uh, don't be too good because I don't need the competition. And uh, I would say if, you, if you're really serious about it, you'll just get it done and you'll do it for free. So many people have a book in their head that they've been talking about for years, but the difference between a writer and somebody who's not a writer is actually taking the time and sitting doing it. And loads of people have started books, but it's finishing it that's the thing. And you have to do it for free. You can't just have a pitch, go in and try and sell it and get money as an advance and everything. All my pals have tried that and it doesn't work. You know, you just you write something you really want to write, then you get hawk it around. You know, and if it's good, people will find it. Like, there's no conspiracy to keep good guys out. You know, think of all the rubbish that's out there. Think of the crap films and the crap TV and the crap books, crap comics. If somebody's even half decent, you'll be found. Ah, oh, Eddie, that's an interesting one. Like, uh, I mean, I grew up loving. Um, Marvel and DC characters, you know, so I'm actually almost spoiled for choice. I've actually written pretty much all the Marvel characters I want to write, like I've done the Avengers and Spider-Man and all these things I used to play at when I was a kid. Um, so I think I'd probably go DC. I've always been a huge Superman fan. I love Batman as well, uh, but Superman's always been a big thing for me, you know, like I, I've got Christopher Reeves' cape from the first Superman film. I've got that hanging up in my office. Like it was the first thing I bought when I got a good royal to check in. Instead of going out and buying a car or something, I bought something semi-useless like Superman's cape. Um, so Superman's got a real resonance for me and I, I think I, I'd like to do Superman. I've done it once. I did a book called Superman Red Sun, but going back and doing Superman would be cool. But Batman's cool too. I don't know, they're all cool, aren't they, you know? The coolest part of Kick-Ass film so far, Gretel, I would say two things probably. I think I loved actually being inside the set on Kick-Ass 2 of Justice Forever's headquarters because it was exactly the way Johnny Romita had drawn it in the book. And to actually see something in 3D that you'd only seen in 2D was really exciting. It was, it was kind of weird walking around and touching stuff that you'd just imagined, you know, like it's nice to think of something and then some poor sucker has to go and design it and then that somebody else has to go and build it, you know. Um, and that's, that, there's something lovely about that. I'd love to take that home with me and just have it as my office or something like that. It'd be great. Um, so I love that. But um, I think first day on the first film, I loved seeing getting filmed. It was the scene, it was quite an iconic one with um, Nicolas Cage shooting uh, Chloe Moritz. Uh, when they were sort of testing out, you know, her sort of fear of bullets and sort of gunfire and so on, as she was wearing a bulletproof vest. And that was at six o'clock in the morning in a sewage factory on the very first day of shooting. And I remember thinking it was less glamorous than I expected it to be. You know, the whole place literally smelled of poo, you know, but like uh, it was, 
I, I don't know, it was really lovely, you know, because the characters were dressed the way they were drawn in the book and, you know, you, you felt as if you were seeing something coming to life. It was a bit like having a baby. You know, something that had been just staying in your mind for a while was actually finally here and that was cool. But I think my favourite bit of that was that I found out you get stunt children as well as stunt men, which I always, th I thought it was the most appalling thing I'd ever seen, which is, okay, like, here's a kid that's less valuable than the kid who's in the movie, you know? And they had this kid being pulled on a rope and doing this really hard fall that they couldn't have Chloe Moritz to. And I kind of loved that. I thought, isn't that hilarious that you'll let your kid go and do something like that, you know? Uh, oh, Albert, I would say, uh, Hit Girl would win the fight. I think she'd be a dirty fighter. I think Yoda's kind of noble, isn't he? He's, uh, you know, he's, he's all about doing the right thing, whereas Hit Girl would just knife him in the balls or something like that, you know? Plus, Yoda's a puppet. He'd have no chance. He'd just be lying there waiting for the Fozzie Bear guy to come and kind of do his voice. Hit Girl would be like, while he's lying there.